Now that we know what we mean by data visualization, let's talk about what makes a visualization useful. By the end of this video, you should be able to recognize the qualities of good data visualizations. You know, there are lots of opinions about criteria for good data visualization, but I really like these three put forth by a leading data science visualization ed educator, Andy Kirk. Data visualization needs to be trustworthy, accessible, and elegant. Let's talk through all three of these in more detail. But before I do, just a quick word about Andy Kirk's book, which I've mentioned a few times already. This book is a great reference for all things data visualization, and I highly recommend it if you wish to dig deeper into this area of study. By saying a visualization is trustworthy, we are saying that the data presented is honestly portrayed. For example, if you're displaying something in such a way that it implies a relationship or a trend, or a correlation, there should be evidence for such relationship in the data. Otherwise, you're just misleading your audience. Let's look at a quick example. Here's a hypothetical figure you might be shown at a business meeting. Take a little and see if you can spot what's wrong with it. If you notice the y-axis, you realize this isn't a surge at all. The y-axis is zoomed into just a small part of the graph. We're looking at a roughly 2% increase between Q1 and Q4. That's hardly surging. I suspect the author of such a chart of trying to be dishonest or at the very least misleading. They're trying to convince me of something which isn't true. Let's just look at all the flaws here. Surge? 2% is a surge? The title's simply misleading. We already mentioned that the y-axis is being zoomed in on to exaggerate the growth between Q1 and Q4. But you, did you notice how the font size and the y-axis seems to be, have been made intentionally small, just so it's hard to read? Lastly, the fourth quarter is when holidays occur. I'd expect to see a rise in profits for many industries during the fourth quarter. A more honest graph might also plot prior year's profits to compare against. So yikes. By the time I'm done reading this graph, I simply do not believe the author anymore. All credibility is gone. So let's see how we could have done this better. Okay, in this figure, we set up the y-axis honestly. And this actually looks like pretty steady revenue over the, each quarter of 2016, so I fixed the title to reflect that. If this is the only year for which we have data, the story might be over. But if we have data from prior years, we should plot them to see how things look. Supposing we have prior year data, if I plot last year's quarterly revenue, I see that there was a surge in profits in 2015, which is absent in 2016. In 2015, the company had a 12% boost between Q1 and Q4, which is less than 2% in 2015. We could have titled this in different ways. We could have just said that our revenue was, not, was, was steady in 2016, and that's not misleading. Or we could focus in on the fact that we didn't see a surge in Q4. Either way, we want to dive into the data more to figure out why we didn't see the revenue boost in Q4 of 2016 that we saw in Q4 of 2015. And we do that prior to presenting these results, so we have good answers of why this happened. So after fixing the presentation and pulling in more hypothetical data, we've actually reversed our initial misleading conclusion. So there are two key takeaways here, which I'll echo some of the messages you heard in for week one. First, you need to take trust seriously. People who are looking at your results are trusting you not to doctor the data or misrepresent results. They wanna take action based on your findings. To make this even more concrete, as a scientist, I often review papers for publication. If I find one seemingly intentionally misleading claim or figure, I call into doubt everything the author said. And if someone similarly tries to mislead, mislead you with poor data visualizations, you shouldn't trust them either. The second point is just a reminder that honesty isn't limited to the visualization stage. Honesty has to be everywhere in data science. And this can be hard at times. You may have your own beliefs about what you'll find in the data. In fact, we could have an entire separate course on how to combat human psychological bias. 
But for now, it suffices to say that you should recognize, recognize the biases you have before you look at the data and do your best to have the data itself, not your bias, drive your inquiry. Our second key principle is accessibility. Accessibility to me is about focusing on your audience and their ability to use your visualization. Let me give you another example. This is a hypothetical example from one of my areas of research, computer architecture. This graph could be useless or great, depending on your audience. For a computer architect, the y-axis is reporting instructions per cycle, or IPC, which is one of three major components of execution time, and the inverse of execution time is often used as a measure of performance. We're reporting average IPC for an accepted benchmark suite, SPEC 2006, 2006, which is used by researchers in computer architecture. If these processor models are real, it's possible I know a lot about them and know how they differ architecturally. That gives me intuition about why these results differ by model. So to someone who knows these processor models, this figure could be honest, as there may be a compelling reason to report only IPC, ignoring the other two elements of execution time and performance. To an expert, this figure could be both honest and accessible, depending on their use. Notice I said depending on their use. If the goal of the figure was to show me the IPCs by processor model, this works great. But as an expert, I might want a more complex figure, which helps explain why the X23i has such higher IPC than the others. So this figure fails if the intent is to not only report IPC, but to also explain why we found these differences. Of course, that might be a separate figure or could just be part of the knowledge of how these processor models differ. But for someone not in computer architecture, this graph means virtually nothing. You don't know what these models of processors are, so you don't know why they may perform differently. You likely don't know what IPC is or even what SPEC 2006 is. So for a non-expert, this figure is clearly not accessible. It's unreadable, has no relevance to them. And if a viewer doesn't know what IPC, that IPC is just one component of performance, this could be unintentionally misleading. So the two main things I'd stress are to know your audience and how they perceive the information, understand what they, what they understand, and know how they might interpret the result. Also be sure to know what the purpose is of your visualization. Are you exploring the data? or presenting it. That helps you craft it in the appropriate way. One last point. Take into account the expected time for the audience to read and understand the result. That depends on whether this is a slide you might show for one minute at a presentation, or a figure that you're sharing with a colleague who might spend some time really diving into it. These questions about your audience and how the visualization will be used allow you to craft it appropriately to make it accessible. What do you think of when you hear the word elegant? You might think about style or grace. You might think about something clear and aesthetically beautiful. These are all, these all reasonably apply to good data visualizations. I would note that in practice, I put a lot more time into elegant visualizations when I'm presenting results. When I'm exploring data, it's nice to have, but it is no means critical. I like to think of it this way. If my graphic is, from, is going to be front and center on the New York Times, it better be perfect. If it's in a slide deck for teaching, it should be really solid. And if it's for me when I'm exploring the data, it should be acceptable. At the very least, the lack of elegance shouldn't get in the way of my interpreting the data. For example, later in this week, you'll be creating an overlay like this. Take a moment to take it in. There are elements of this which are elegant. The use of an overlay on a map helps an observer see the different countries quickly. The color coding to show numeric data helps the viewer quickly interpret results. The color scheme goes towards darker blue with more CO2 emissions per capita. So that actually might not be perfect. More CO2 emissions per capita is arguably a bad thing. So a different color scheme which conveys the CO2 emissions as bad might actually be better. There isn't unnecessary other data here. I didn't put the numbers over each country as that likely distract more than it help. 
I didn't try to combine this with some other measure like GDP per capita in the same figure as it likely be too much to process, but might make a really nice complementary figure. If I added any additional decorations, like maybe a smokestack on high CO2 per capita producers, I'd be sure it added to the figure rather than det detracted. With this figure, I thought it actually detracted more than it added, so I left it off. Overall, style and beauty is subjective, but I think when we look into our case studies at the end of this week, you'll be able to appreciate the elegance of some of their designs. We'll also give you links to websites and talks, which were exceptionally elegant visualizations as well. For elegant visualizations, you should focus on what is relevant and remove anything which isn't adding to the figure. You're trying to make the design invisible so the viewer can take as much from the visualization as possible without being distracted. Now, this isn't the same thing as minimalism, which I've heard some folks argue for. I feel minimalism doesn't just remove the unnecessary, but often starts to remove things which are helpful. So there's a balance to be struck with how much to include. Think about your style. For those of you who read Nate Silver's website 538, you know there's a distinct style to his presentations and graphs. To me, I really like that style, and his website success, I think, is likely tied, at least in part, to how recognizable his style is in presentation. Decorations may seem contrary to honesty, and in some cases, they kind of are. In scientific papers about blood donations, I'd be surprised to see the bars in a bar chart intentionally made to resemble flowing blood. But if the graphic is put out by a charity encouraging folks to give blood the week before Halloween, decorations may bring the visualization extra attention. And this just goes back to knowing your intended audience. If this were a data visualization course in a design lab, we could have spent much of the course just on exploring these principles in depth. Our hope with this course is to just give you some concrete goals that you can aspire toward when you're creating your visualizations.